Chapter 2. The Meetings Begin. Having left the Pentagon with energy, enthusiasm and more questions, I looked forward to the next meeting with this unusual visitor from another planet. It would be approximately one year later before I would hear his voice and see his face again. During that period of time, I'd been questioned by the FBI regarding my strange adventure of entering the Pentagon. In fact, they met me at my flight into New York upon my return from the Washington, D.C. meetings I had been conducting. I was taken to the FBI office where I was interrogated for nearly three hours. I myself could hardly believe the experience I had just had, let alone attempting to convince government intelligence officers the same. They finally gave me a polygraph test and I was allowed to leave. As the years went on, he began to confide certain information to me, regarding some of their activities on this planet. He informed me that they were in the process of establishing what he called communication bases in private residences. From city to city, in major areas around the globe, individuals of high character and commitment had been contacted and their assistance had been enlisted to accomplish this goal. Today, some of these areas include Reno, Nevada, San Diego, California, Geneva, Switzerland, and even Los Angeles, California. In these homes you will find communication equipment unlike any you can scarcely imagine. There is a holographic communicator which operates in the middle of the room. All you have to do is sit in a chair located along the perimeter and suddenly you are seeing the physical image of the one to whom you are speaking. Perhaps this is what is meant by personal contact. The first time I saw this device in use, at a home in the Los Angeles area, I could hardly believe my eyes. Actually, I went up to the image and ran my hand through it. It looked so true to life, as if the person were actually standing right in front of me. That person got quite a laugh out of my bold, unusual actions. In addition to this holographic device, there is other equipment with which those space visitors can communicate with other of their ships, that are located on and around Earth, including the Starship, which is their home base and orbits above this planet. In order to blend with others on this planet, they use public transportation to move about from city to city. For the most part, this would be flying by commercial airlines. It is amazing to watch the faces and reactions of people when these angelic beings come into the presence of earthlings. Some will feel a strange sensation throughout their bodies, some will giggle and not know why, some will become very emotional, perhaps tears will well up in their eyes. Others still, will be totally unaware that there is someone present who is not of this world. When they are working in a particular city, a car is provided for them by their host in that city. There are others who contribute of their good fortune to assure that all the needs of Vi and any of his crew are met in the process of appearing as normal as possible as they go about their work on this planet. While they have the capability to materialize anything that they wish, this action would obviously draw unnecessary attention to them and thereby defeat their purpose. On rare occasions, when the need arises, they will use one of their smaller transport ships, such as the one which Vi used to land in Alexandria, Virginia. Most times, this is at night and when time is of the essence. Time continued to pass and as I became more acquainted with Vi and others, he began to prepare me for yet another fantastic experience which would shortly take place, an experience I will never forget as long as I live. Chapter 3. A Life Spared A knock at the door, a special delivery letter, an invitation to be a guest speaker at a UFO convention in West Germany. This was to begin a chapter in my life that was designed by certain dark forces to remove me from circulation permanently. The members of our party made their way to New York's Kennedy Airport in November, 1967. After our flight from Los Angeles, we had several hours before leaving for Frankfurt. I took time to phone my parents who resided in New York at that time. Many thoughts were going through our minds as we discussed our itinerary which would take us to several European countries for the first time. We had been invited to West Germany, Finland, Sweden and England on this trip. To our great surprise, when we boarded the plane, our seats had been given to a woman who was traveling with three children and required the bulkhead seats which had previously been assigned to us. We followed the steward as he led us to the first class seating. With a smile, he said, I hope that you have a pleasant trip. With that, he winked and carried on with his own business. The flight had experienced some delay in departing from Kennedy Airport, but our flight to Germany was uneventful, and we landed in the cool overcast. Evidently, we had missed the party who was to meet us in Frankfurt because of our delay. 
it was almost comical to call someone on the telephone, because the coin rang up in the middle of our conversation at least three times, and I found myself talking into a dead phone. However, we finally did make a good connection, and were instructed to proceed to Mainz by taxi. Our driver's English was limited to three expressions, yes, no, and forty marks. A comedy, to be sure. At last we arrived in Mainz, and the taxi wandered through several narrow, yet interesting streets, which are typical in most European communities. He finally came to a stop in front of the Mainzerhof Hotel, took our luggage, and deposited it in the lobby and delivered us safe and sound to the German delegation, who assisted us in registering at the front desk. I personally anticipated a very wonderful convention, not realizing that this trip could have cost me my life. Herr Karl Feit, the convention host and a dear friend, greeted us warmly as we entered the dining room on the top floor of the hotel. The windows overlooked the beautiful Rhine River. A number of boats floated by, reflecting the sun of that beautiful but chilly afternoon. Others, including Professor Hermann Obert, known as the father of rocketry, and Coleman von Kevicksky, who had publicly challenged the Pentagon on many occasions on UFOs, stood up at the table and made us feel welcome. Mr. Fight ordered dinner for all of us and we sat down to enjoy this festive occasion. It was quite impossible to order even a simple glass of water with our meals in any country during our trip unless we called it by name. So consequently, that was the first phrase we learned in each country we visited. The only place this was not necessary was in England. At least they understood what we meant, although when you visit an English-speaking country after several other foreign language countries, you almost feel as if you don't know your own language anymore. It was quite strange. We were visiting these countries not to involve ourselves in any political discussions but to share our findings about unidentified flying objects and the possibility of life, as we know it, existing in the mass universe. We were cautioned not to participate in any political altercations. The convention hall was within walking distance from the hotel and so the first morning most of us walked through the brisk cool air, glad we had brought warm clothing. The streets were exceedingly clean and the people very warm and friendly. The members of the press met us at the hall and following a brief session of questions and picture taking, we met other members of Mr. Fight's staff along with many other people who expressed their joy in meeting all of us. The atmosphere was charged with excitement and expectancy. Flower decorated the hall along with the flags of all nations. Many of the speakers had already arrived and were huddled here and there answering the questions of very curious people. As the convention was officially opened by Mr. Fight, the speakers were introduced. They included Coleman von Kevicksky, Professor Hermann Obert, Dr. Wilk Martin, J. V. Jacobi, Professor Alfred Naun, Carl L. Feit, Erfinder Friedrich Hummel, D. Grasso, W. Losensky Fillet, Roberto Pinotti, Ng, Eric Halid, Dr. Kurt Koffinen, Ng, Walter Orr, Frau Luisa Eskig, D. F. Ross, Professor Dr. G. Macaluso, Avold Noor, Eric von Deniken, and myself. I was scheduled to appear twice. Once to present a UFO lecture and again to present our UFO documentary film, Phenomena 7.7. The film was scheduled to be shown on the evening of November 5 at 1600 hours. Prior to that time, I was called to be interviewed by two men from a large Italian newspaper type magazine. One said he was a reporter and the other a photographer. We sat at a small table in the dining room during which time we had a light lunch. Most of their questions were aimed at learning the full facts regarding my contact with Vi Thor. They said they had read my books, My Friend from Beyond Earth, Flying Saucerama and Stranger at the Pentagon. With their tape recorder going, they questioned me about as many details concerning Vi as I could give them. I gave them a detailed account leading up to my meeting with Vi. They kept asking me over and over again, Where is he now? I responded with the same answer each time and occasionally dipped my spoon into my bowl of tomato soup. Then, a young man tapped me on the shoulder and informed me that there was a long-distance call for me from Finland. I excused myself from the table and proceeded to take the call. It was from Rev. Leo Meller, one of the sponsoring pastors of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association, who along with the Methodist Church, sponsored us at the University of Helsinki. Rev. Meller called to inquire as to what time we were expecting to arrive in Helsinki. Following the phone conversation, I returned to the table only to learn that the two men were gone. The table had been wiped clean except for my bowl of soup. 
Perplexed, I sat down and swallowed a tablespoonful of the soup and then I knew something was wrong, very wrong. I tasted a gritty substance that burned like fire all the way down into my stomach. I made a quick grab for a glass of water on a nearby counter. I immediately located my interpreter, Mr. Anthony Lowe, and together we rushed back to the hotel. By this time, blood was trickling out of my mouth and down the front of my shirt. He knew I was growing sicker and weaker with each passing moment. Upon reaching my room, he quickly administered a dose of powder, which he stirred into a glass of water, and which he had mixed before leaving the university where he was studying. As a medical student, he had access to medical supplies. He did not tell me the contents of the vial, because he did not know. He claimed he was instructed to mix this substance and bring it with him to mites. I swallowed the contents of the glass and fell into a deep sleep. Yet I was keenly aware that I was not alone in this experience. Upon awakening, the pain and discomfort had vanished. I reached for a glass of water, which was on the nightstand and slowly sipped some. It felt good and cool, all the way down into my stomach. Within a matter of moments, the telephone rang. It was Vi Thor, calling from Switzerland. His words sounded very mellow, yet stern. He said, Frank, how many times have I cautioned you to be very careful with whom you meet? He continued, There are many, many lessons to be learned and oftentimes, they are painful. However, I am certain that you gain from this experience. Please exercise extreme care. Vi stated that there were, in fact, men in black, not just in dress, but in motive and in heart. He said he would elaborate later, when we could meet in person in the United States. He also added that several of his people would be watching us for the duration of our European trip. Forces of darkness following a cleansing of my system, I felt like a newborn babe. Conversations that I had enjoyed with Vi in the past were streaming into my thinking. He made mention at one time that not all space beings were of God, that there were some motivated by the forces of darkness, and that additional information would be given to me at a later time. I was then to learn the meaning of those words. That in the beginning, when there was war in the heaven lies, Lucifer and his crew had been cast down into the earth. The only power they lost was that of being in the presence of the Divine Creator. And Lucifer was still permitted to travel through a small corridor into the presence of God, where to this day, he attempts to accuse the saints. Vi informed me of many things regarding these angels. He told me that it is important for all men and women who are children of true light to learn the art of spiritual as well as mental self-defense. When I returned to the convention hall, all was ready for my presentation. The audience response was warm and friendly as they listened with interest, desirous to learn the truth about space, science and true religion. The following day, Inquiry was made and we were not too amazed to learn that the Italian magazine had no knowledge of the two who claimed to represent them at the convention. Many years ago, I gave my life over to Jesus Christ, and I knew that in years to come, many revelations would be given me for the purpose of showing the way to others. However, the way would not be easy, but then again, it would be fruitful, because of the fact that there are many blessings for those who dare to walk out of step from the rest of the crowd as one's ears become attuned to the beat of the distant drummer. Another experience, another warning, another time to prove that God is with us, and that there is help available to those who dare to believe. However, the best was still to come.